Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Andrew Curran and I'm HSE's Chief Scientific Advisor, and it's my huge pleasure to welcome you to the launch of our annual science review for 2022. It's my great privilege to be able to represent uh, the science that's delivered by the organisation through our annual science review. Uh, and I'm very proud today to be able to uh, share that opportunity with some of the fantastic scientists and engineers that we have working across the organisation. Just a little housekeeping to start with, if I may, if uh, people who are joining us can make sure they're on mute, that would be much appreciated. Um, we have a uh, an app that we're using for questions today, which is in the chat and will appear throughout the presentation both as a link and as a QR code that you can scan uh, to take you to the site. But without further ado, um, let me make a start and we're gathered today to talk you through our annual science review. This is a document that we produce every year, highlighting some of the work that we've done um, to support HSE in its uh, vision and its mission. And uh, a lot of this work is done at our Science and Research Centre, which is based in Buxton. And on a fantastic day like today that we have in many parts of the UK, uh, you can see what a fantastic place it is to uh, deliver science and engineering evidence and expertise to HSE. And we use the topography of our site to enable us to do some of the large scale experiments that you hear about later on. But of course, uh, uh, it's important that we listen to what the concerns of the wider communities are. So as we progress through the presentations today, please do feel free to ask us questions. You can see the Mentimeter QR code on the screen and you can see the link as well. Uh, you'll be able to post your questions there and also vote for those questions that others have asked before you if you would uh, like to register your uh, support for them. So please do use that uh, QR code to take you to the website. It's also really great to be able to talk to you today about our science review in the context of HSE's new strategy, which was launched a few weeks ago, and you can see the link down there. And I think what we'll be able to do uh, both uh, in the presentations today and moving forward is to demonstrate how we can deliver the science and evidence that HSE needs to inform its policy and regulatory approaches when it comes to the areas highlighted in the new strategy. And if we look at those uh, from the science perspective, there are four areas where I think we can add significant value and indeed a lot of the presentations today will address uh, some of these individual areas. So clearly uh, work and health is a big issue and one of the objectives within the strategy is to uh, do more perhaps to reduce work related ill health, focusing particularly on mental health and stress in the workplace. And we'll hear uh, some work that we've done uh, in this area uh, later on today. We're also looking to make sure that we deliver our responsibilities under both the building safety regulator activities and indeed the uh, additional work that we will now be doing on chemicals regulation so that we can make sure that people trust us to look after them when it comes to their safety in the workplace and also in their environment. We'll also be telling you about some of the work that we've been doing in partnership with others to think about the issues that might arise if we don't pre-plan and understand what the risks might be when we're innovating and moving towards net zero. Uh, and we'll hear about some of the hydrogen work that we've been doing in that particular space. And of course, it's really important uh, that we maintain Great Britain's record as one of the safest countries to work. And we'll be hearing about some of the asbestos work that we've been doing to support those activities. So of the five key strategic statements within the uh, new HC strategy, these are the areas in particular where we will be able to show hopefully in the next uh, 45 minutes or so how science engineering and evidence has already started to support those ambitions. In addition to that, uh, we've continued to deliver work uh, as 
uh, one of the leaders of a national core study uh, on COVID-19, uh, the so-called PROTECT study. And uh, the first set of presentations will be around some work that has been delivered, first of all, to understand how outbreaks occur in workplaces and what we can understand uh, perhaps to help prevent those happening in the future. And then secondly, how we've developed approaches that enable us to understand how droplets and aerosols can result from uh, the activities associated with coughing. The PROTECT National Core Study is one of six National Core Studies instigated by Sir Patrick Vallance and uh, Professor Chris Whitty to make sure that the UK was acting on the best available evidence in its pandemic response. And I'm really proud that we've been uh, one of the, the six organisations leading this uh, activity and hopefully uh, in the next couple of presentations you'll be able to hear a little bit more about what it is we've done, what we've learned and how the information that we have gathered will help to deliver a long lasting legacy, not just from a COVID perspective, but from a wider business continuity perspective when it comes to airborne respiratory viruses. So I'm very pleased to be able to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Yichin Chen, who's going to start our presentation today by talking about the COVID outwork, which has been investigating work break outbreaks of COVID-19. So Yichin, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I'm going to present the COVID out study, which is part of the wider, much bigger PROTECT national core study. The COVID out study is about the investigation of COVID-19 outbreaks in the workplace that support the, the current national uh, pa uh, pandemic response, as well as for future pandemic preparedness. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I've changed each end. Have you seen the? Yeah. Is that the right one? Going the next one. Yeah, that's right. This is the right one. So, the COVID out study includes rapid on the ground investigation of outbreak sites, as well as comprehensive analysis of outbreak data at the national level, with the aim to understand the virus transmission risk factors, transmission routes, and their relative importance, and the evidence we collect can support effective control strategies. The program is led by HSC, but we work with colleagues across HSC, outside of HSC, across government and universities to coordinate very comprehensive investigation as well as sharing critical data, which would not be possible before the pandemic. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There seems to be a, a delay in... Um, I think there's a delay, Chin. So uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, outbreak investigation, the on the ground investigation, is very difficult study to do. First of all, we need to understand where the outbreaks were occurring. We were able to access the UK HSA and HSC outbreak investigation records, so we can have daily and weekly notification of outbreaks. We also actively engage with local authority, public health, so we can have notification as early as possible. As soon as we have the notification, we need to recruit a company, which proved to be very challenging because the study is voluntary um, based on informed consent. For every 10 companies we actively engage, we only can recruit one, so 10% success rates. As soon as we have employees' consent, we will get on to the outbreak site. The first things we do is swap the surface to understand the level of contaminations. If proved to be very useful part of the study to understand the relative importance of the transmission routes. We also look at the physical environments, the occupancy rates, ventilation system, work activity and the control measures. We recruit workers, ask them to complete comprehensive questionnaire, three weekly PCR and two antibody, antibody blood tests six weeks apart. Next slide, please. And and you will see in the next slide, um, we have investigated our 20 outbreak site covering from January 2021 to March 2022, relevance to Alpha, Delta and Omicron variants across different sectors, including food and non-food manufacturing sectors, warehouse distribution centres, public sector office, 
science conference that fills some of the important evidence gap in the literature. Next slide, please. of the building plant, we can see the spread of the cases in the outbreak site, the variation of attack rates in association of occupancy rate and the effectiveness of the ventilations. Next slide, please. And then in the next slide, and uh, will be another example to show how we track cases spread in the outbreak sites. And here you can see that um, night shift workforce have five times higher attack rates than the day shift workers. But the first day shift workers test positive was the partner of the night shift workers who were test positive four days ago. The success of these companies, they were able to have the control measures to stop the spread of the cases from night shift to day shift. Next slide, please. And that's another, another example to show that we cannot investigate workplace outbreak in isolations. We look at the outbreak in the workplace over time and compare to the community infection rates. The second outbreak in this workplace is much bigger outbreaks, four weeks ahead of the community infection rate increase that relevance to Delta variant um, pandemic. Next slide, please. And we put all these data together to understand the complex and interplay risk factors contribute to the COVID-19 outbreaks. Next slide, please. And we are disseminate our knowledge and lesson learned through the peer review publications. We're going to accelerate this process this year to support future pandemic preparedness. Please watch the space and follow COVID out study publications. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Yi Chin. Um, and this is really important work um, that has enabled us to, as you say, understand how those risk factors come together for uh, outbreaks to occur. So we'll move on now to another piece of work, uh, slightly different, but still looking at the uh, issues around the pandemic and transmission of, of viruses in the air. And uh, I'll ask Paul Johnson uh, to tell us about the work that he and the team have been doing developing a human cough simulator. So Paul, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, OK, uh, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm a chemist at the Science Division of HSC, and I would like to present HSC's cough simulator on behalf of the project team. Uh, the need for the simulator arose from the use of face shields during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, personal and respiratory protection equipment, PPE and RPE, has been vital in the strategy to control the exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Excuse me. Face shields are used in healthcare industry and by the public to provide splash protection or additional protection from masks, so RPE, and there has been a presumed protection against droplets in the context of COVID-19. Face shields for the use of work for use of work are designed and tested to BS166 or equivalent standards, and designs are subjected to a surrogate splash test. However, they are not assessed for protection from droplets as generated by coffee. Uh, scientists and engineers at HSC Science and Research Centre conducted a study to assess the level of wearer protection afforded by face shields against such droplets in different head orientations. HSC designed and engineered a human cough simulator that provided a standardised cough challenge to different face shield designs and orientations. OK, if we can move on to the next slide, please. OK, experimental, experimental setup it was as shown. The cough simulator delivers 4.2 litres of air containing an aerosol with a fluorescent dye. This is to aid visualisation. The flow rate profile of the simulator matches that determined from a study of human subjects with influenza. The target face shield is mounted on the breathing mannequin head on a cradle that allows for different orientations. 
these different orientations reflects the relative positions of the face shield wearer and the person coughing. So they could be beneath you on a bed, they could be above you in a restaurant or cutting your hair. OK, I've taken the risk of putting a couple of videos into my presentation. So uh, next slide, please. It's not working particularly well. Okay. So what you saw there was uh, the first video shows the cough simulator being operated. The pistons are set. A tube is filled with an aerosol of fluorescent dye. Uh, a leak is introduced to unsettle the pistons and the cough is produced. Uh, it's a very reproducible process. We've automated it since uh, that video was taken, uh, which, I think, which makes it even more reproducible. OK. If we can have the next slide, please. OK, this slide is from a different project looking at interventions to coffee. It shows in slow motion, fairly obviously, a backlit cough with a hand over the mouth. It's a bit juddery, I'm afraid, but you get the, the gist. You can see that the cough is being redirected through the gaps in the fingers. Not quite as smooth as I was hoping. OK, and finally, slide six. So, OK, so what were the benefits of this work? The protective, protectiveness of different face shields against simulated cough droplets was determined, including how this was affected by various factors. An appropriate method was developed for use in resource limited settings where access to other PPE may be difficult. So testing is perhaps more appropriate. Uh, the cough simulator has been and continues to be used in, to investigate other infection control scenarios. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much indeed, Paul. And I think you know, that this again illustrates the need that we had during the pandemic to develop new approaches to assess risk as we began to understand a bit more about how the virus moved around environments and what behaviours people were showing in those different environments. Yes, this came Just out the of the, uh, PP, sorry, this came out of the PP technical team, which was advising um, during the pandemic as well. So another benefit, benefit of that. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, and and uh, it's fair to say that it was an enormous piece of work assessing the personal protective equipment that was entering the UK supply chain. And HSE had the job of market surveillance for PPE during that period um, when we had teams working from seven in the morning till 11 o'clock at night, making sure that personal protective equipment actually protected the people who were wearing it. Thank you, Paul. Um, we need to move on. So uh, we're now going to talk a little bit more about the net zero situation and uh, really pleased that uh, uh, Dr. Mark Purcell and Diane Kerr from uh, both the science side and the regulation side are going to be doing a, a joint presentation talking about the work that they've been doing uh, to enable the safe blending of hydrogen into the natural gas network. So uh, Mark and Diane, over to you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Andrew. OK, so this, this next presentation is going to look at um, HSE's involvement um, in the high deployed project and the safe demonstration of hydrogen blending into the gas network. Um, the background to this project aligns with one of HSE's strategic objectives to support development of safe approaches for reducing carbon emissions in the UK. And this is aligned with the, the government's net zero target for by, by 2050. So currently in the UK, um, heat provision to domestic homes and to industrial processes accounts for around about a third of our CO2 emissions. So if we can reduce the carbon footprint of the, of the heating in the UK, then we can make substantial contributions to that net zero target. So one approach to achieving this is by substituting natural gas supplies for hydrogen, which is derived from, <clears throat> uh, from low carbon sources, such as electrolyzers that might be running off wind power, for example. Um, however, the introduction of hydrogen has some uh, safety challenges. For example, it's got wider flammability, flammability limits. Uh, it also has potential interactions with the materials that the gas network is constructed from. So the talk that uh, I'm going to give today with, with um, Diane is going to look at a couple of ways that HSC has been contributing to this net zero project. Um, to ensure that the gas network can be operated safely. So as, as Andrew said, I'm, I'm Mark Passar, I'm working the Explosive Atmospheres team in Science Division, and I'm going to talk about the work that HSE has done um, contributing to this, directly into this external project using the people and the facilities at HSE's research centre in Buxton. Uh, and also talking today is Diane Kerr. Um, Diane, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Uh, yes, hi, I'm Diane. I'm a frontline mechanical engineering specialist in the regulatory branch of HSC. I'm responsible for assessing safety cases for major hazard sites and carrying out on-site verification inspections. For the High Deploy project, the regulator's aim was to support the UK government's net zero ambitions, whilst ensuring that safety standards were not compromised during the blended gas trial that Mark's about to describe. Uh, next slide, please. OK, if you can actually go back one, Andrew, I think you got, you got ahead of yourself. Um, thanks. So, uh, as I mentioned, HC's, once HC's strategic objectives is to support industry to safely innovate and deliver the UK government's net zero target. Um, and there's a number of ways that HC can do this. And our involvement in, in the high deployed project kind of demonstrates two of these. So in, in these following slides, um, we've uh, color coded them either green or red to distinguish work which has been done in through different mechanisms. So I'm going to talk through the green slides, which represents the work that is uh, directly inputted into the highly deployed project and we've undertaken uh, research through the bespoke research and consultancy from HSC um, channel uh, which has been utilizing the people and the facilities of the science research center and the, the objective there is to determine whether it's safe to add hydrogen into the gas network and i'm going to talk through the red slides uh, and these represent work undertaken by HSC regulation which involved an expert team of regulatory and specialist inspectors and science division colleagues scrutinising and challenging the safety evidence submitted by the High Deploy Consortium. And this was to ensure that the existing high safety standards of the gas network would be maintained when hydrogen was added to the gas stream during the trial. Uh, the HSC research and regulatory teams worked totally independently from each other and strict governance and controls were employed to maintain this independence and the impartiality of the regulatory review function. Next slide, please. OK, so a little bit of a background about the High Deploy project itself. So this is um, uh, funded through Ofgem through its gas network innovation scheme. And the purpose of that is to um, reduce customer costs and also to ensure the security of supply. So these align with the net zero ambitions for the country to ensure that the gas system is fit for purpose for the future. So the High Deploy project um, uh, is there's a consortium behind the High Deploy project, which is delivering the project. Uh, and this is led by uh, Caden and Northern Gas Networks, who are the two gas distribution network companies. Uh, there's Progressive Energy, who are a, a sustainable energy technical consultancy and project management organization. Um, and there's us ourselves, who've been primarily focused on delivering the, the safety evidence. Uh, and there's also Kiwi University, who were the site of the first um, trial of, of blended gas, uh, and also ITM Power, who are a supplier or manufacturer of electrolyzers, which is a, a route to producing green hydrogen. So the project objective is to uh, add in up to 20% hydrogen into the gas network, and as part of this, demonstrate that it's safe to do this and it's safe to use by the, by the end users. And this aligns with the UK's net zero ambitions. Um, the government in 2020 produced its uh, uh, its roadmap for a green industrial revolution, and as part of that, hydrogen plays a, a, a an important role. And within that, there's a, a key milestone to demonstrate that blending is feasible by the end of 2023. So, if we can blend 20% hydrogen into the gas network, the benefit is um, the potential to deliver up to 29 terawatts of low carbon heating. But to put that in a more sort of tangible framework that's the equivalent of removing 2.5 million cars from UK roads. Next slide please. <clears throat> okay so the blended gas demonstrations which are part of high deploy they undertook a first demonstration at Keele University which was on what's classed as a private network um, and then what we're talking about today is the demonstration which is ongoing at Winlayton this is a, a public network it's a a typical kind of housing estate, which has got 668 domestic homes, normal homes. Uh, it also ha has a, a school, a church, and a few small commercial businesses. <clears throat> to enable the blending, um, they located the grid entry unit close to Winlayton. Uh, there's a couple of pictures on the slides here. So one shows the site, which the, the green box in the middle is the, the grid entry unit, and, and the internals are shown in the other picture. And the main function of the grid entry unit was to mix the hydrogen to the required level, matching the incoming gas demand, uh, and ensure that we didn't go beyond the 20% limit. Next slide, please. Uh, the UK's gas distribution networks, including the Wynn Layton trial area, 
are subject to the Gas Safety Management Regulations, GSMR. These regulations apply to the conveyance and supply of natural gas to the public, and they cover four main areas, including the safe management of gas flow through a network, particularly those parts supplying domestic consumers, arrangements for dealing with supply emergencies arising from loss of pressure in a network, arrangements for dealing with reported gas escape and gas incidents, and gas composition. Uh, the latter is particularly relevant to the win latent trial, as uh, GSMR permits a maximum of 0.1% hydrogen in the gas flow. In order to carry out the trial and distribute blended gas containing up to 20% hydrogen, the network operator, NGN, applied for a GSMR exemption and submitted safety evidence to support their application. Under GSMR, HSE may issue an exemption if the evidence submitted by the operator demonstrates that the health and safety of persons likely to be affected by the exemption will not be prejudiced in consequence of it. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the work undertaken by Science Division um, fed into the safety evidence for the GSMR exemption application. Um, and as part of this, we conducted in-depth technical assessments to determine that the safe to put hydrogen into the network and it's safe for appliances to use to blend the gas. Um, and in doing this, we undertook a, did it through a number of stages through literature reviews, um, technical analysis and mathematical modeling, and some extensive technical pro, uh, experimental programs. So the images on this slide showed a uh, sort of snapshot of some of these experimental programs. So the upper image, um, so that shows a, a safety simulation of gas release and accumulation in a domestic home. Um, and this was built around some experimental work which we undertaken in, in the large wind tunnels that we've got inside our facility. Uh, so we, we, we conducted these accumulation, accumulation tests and, and measured any changes. We then also looked at the consequence of, um, of gas releases and explosions. So we built a, uh, a bespoke rig, which is a mock-up of a domestic home. And then we undertook a range of explosion tests within within this um, domestic home to understand how adding hydrogen would then change the, the explosion outcomes. So the, the areas which we examined throughout this work centered around um, reviewing the industry operating procedures. Uh, we undertook an assessment of the gas seed materials. So that's the materials that make up primarily make up the gas network. Uh, and then also extensive experimental testing on the you know, operation of gas appliances. As a result of all this work, we produced over 40 technical reports, um, and this fed into a specific uh, QRA or quantified risk assessment for the wind latent trial site. Um, and all the output from the work, the technical reports are all available on the IGM Knowledge Hub, so that's the Institute of Gas Engineers and Managers. Next slide, please. Uh, the safety evidence provided by the High Deploy Consortium was reviewed by a multidiscipline team led by regulatory and pipeline specialists from HSE's energy division, with support from various topic specialists. Our objective was to determine whether the risks arising from the trial were ad adequately controlled by the network operator and whether it was appropriate for HSE to issue a GSMR exemption certificate. My role as a mechanical specialist was to assess the design and construction standards of new equipment installed as part of the trial, such as the hydrogen injection unit, and to look at whether exposure to hydrogen would increase the likelihood of failure of existing network components. My HC colleagues looked at the evidence provided on aspects such as quantified risk assessment, including fire and explosion risks, household appliance testing with blended gas, the enhanced leak detection arrangements implemented during the trial period, and communication with GasSafe, the UK's accreditation body for gas engineers. The HSE assessment team reviewed the 40 plus documents submitted uh, and raised 229 challenges relevant to trial safety. These were re resolved by means of further information requests and meetings with the high deploy team. And once the regulatory team was satisfied that safety standards wouldn't be compromised during the trial, a one-year GSMR exemption certificate was issued. Uh, the win latent trial has now been running successful to, successfully for approximately uh, 10 months uh, and has an, another two months to go. Um, and that's the end of our presentation. Thank you.
Thanks very much indeed, uh, Diane and Mark. And I think illustrates very nicely how the science and evidence that we can generate uh, as HSE enables some of these issues to be addressed. So we're uh, using that evidence to enable new technologies to make sure that safety isn't compromised and uh, delivering, therefore, our contribution to that objective within the strategy to uh, help support the introduction of net zero uh, actions. Moving on to another area within the strategy now, uh, and we're going to talk a bit about buildings. But before we do that, just a reminder that uh, if you scan the QR code, that should take you to the voting area. And also just to let you know that we are recording today's event, so you'll be able to watch it uh, afterwards if you've missed any of it. Uh, if you don't want your name to be recorded, please uh, just let us know and we'll make sure that uh, doesn't happen. Um, but without further ado, let me hand over to Ed Corbett, who's going to talk a little bit about the work that's been done looking at some of the potential uh, scenarios that might occur in high rise residential buildings in support of HSE's new role as the building safety regulator. So Ed, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, my name's Ed. I'm a psychologist in HSE Science Division. We had quite a large multidisciplinary team on this, uh, this piece of work. So we, I have put a link in the bottom there to the research report if anyone's interested in reading the full context there for the work that we did. Yeah, to set the scene and the context for this a little bit more, as you might imagine, it's directly related to the uh, the Grenfell Tower tragedy, which was uh, we just passed the sort of five year anniversary there. There was a loss of 72 lives, uh, a similar number of people seriously injured as well, so quite a significant event. Um, following on from the incident, there was a, an independent review uh, that uh, identified that there were um, inadequacies in the current regulatory processes and systems that were in place. Uh, and this research following on from that was done for the joint regulators group of which HSC uh, is a part of or was a part of. Uh, also, as a bit more context, this was prior to the Building Safety Act coming into place. So this was the work was done prior to HSC being a key part of the new Building Safety Regulator as well. Uh, so the scope of the work was very much around identifying these preliminary uh, serious incident scenarios. So not to say that these are the uh, the only factors that need to be considered, but certainly a starting point for those who need to manage these kinds of, uh, of scenarios and hazards. When we talk about serious incident scenarios, we're talking about what we often refer to as low frequency, high consequence type events. And I guess in simple terms, what we're talking about in the context here is some kind of event that could adversely impact the health or safety of quite a, a significant number of people. In relation to the controls part, we were really trying to explore uh, what factors could be brought into play to prevent or limit harm occurring, uh, as well as bringing things back into a safe state if an incident did occur. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. As part of the methodology, we looked at a number of different uh, ways of gathering information and knowledge about this. So we started off with a, a literary review, trying to identify if work had already been done in this area. We looked at some of the grey literature as well. So some of the, I guess, media reports around these types of incidents as well, all that came into play there. We did an expert review of regulatory approaches. So that included the existing approaches, processes in the, in the sector, but also other processes that may be applicable. And we also ran a number of stakeholder workshops with various subject matter experts who uh, work within that sector as well. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. So to summarise the findings, we did identify those key uh, scenarios. As you might expect, fire was a, a key one of those, which came out quite strongly in the uh, engagement with key stakeholders and also in the literature, uh, but also explosion and structural uh, as key uh, key scenarios as well within that. Uh, related to those scenarios are how the, those um, events can cascade or escalate, and that's often via, via various pathways uh, with the Grenfell strategy, we can see that through the, the cladding, but there are other pathways which um, these incidents can, can spread and become more significant. Uh, and within buildings, that can be across a whole floor or it could be between floors, so upward and downwards within a building as well. We also looked at some of the things that can exacerbate or bring things back into control as well. So we looked at factors around evacuation, things like emergency response, and we also looked at various failures that could occur within safety systems as well. So that could include things like failures with, uh, with sprinkler systems within buildings. Following on from that, we looked at uh, what would work as a way of trying to control these sorts of factors and these risks better within the sector. Uh, and we identified there that a safety case regime would be uh, a workable solution in this kind of context. So uh, some of the benefits of, uh, of a safety case regime is that they do allow an entire building to be considered within the, the, the safety case itself uh, and also the surrounding context. So any sort of factors that come into play because of the, the situation and contextual factors of a, a particular building. Um, 
some of the important elements of a safety case as well for those of you less familiar is that a safety case uh, means that a demonstration has to be produced on the identification of risks, um, a demonstration that those are understood and controlled appropriately, and also it acts as a communication method for key stakeholders, which would include a regulator as well. Uh, some of the other benefits in this context are the flexibility, so it does allow a step change to take place. So this is going to be quite new for the for the sector, so it allows a sort of gradual uh, move towards what might be a more sort of significant safety case. But we may be able to start with more of a safety narrative uh, to get people up to up to speed and competent in this kind of area. Uh, it also allows the identification and more accountability by having a, a duty holder in place. Uh, and it also allows flexibility and adaptability as well. So as risk profiles might change, we've we've heard a little bit about some of the net zero work. So if if there is, for example, impact and changes to risk profile because of, of those kind of changes, then they can be taken into account within a, a safety case type regime. It also allows over time the incorporation of good practice as well. So as good practice uh, uh, changes and improves over time, that can also be incorporated into a safety case and a safety case regime. Uh, next slide, please, Andrew. So just as um, I guess some points on the application and some key takeaways here. So it's the, the work is already feeding into the new building safety regulator and that will feed into elements of, of guidance and some of the policy decisions that are made there. Uh, and I guess maybe not a surprise that uh, I guess tying all this together, the glue that holds all this together is, is really the people who are involved in, in this sector, this, uh, this industry as well. Um, so leadership are going to be absolutely critical to making the new system work. And that includes aspects of competence around uh, the a safety case type regime and controlling risks and also the tone that's set for safety by key leadership as well. So there are many sort of conflicting goals that can come into play here. Um, we've certainly seen a lot about the challenges in relation to managing the balance with safety and some of the budgetary constraints within the sector. So yeah, that tone for safety is going to be really, really critical to getting things right. And that's uh, hopefully a summary of the uh, the work that we did there for you. And do check out the full report if you have some interest in that. Thanks, Ed. Really, really useful. And if we move on to uh, the next area, which is uh, moving away from the places to the environment, uh, it's a great pleasure to ask Lisa, Lisa Mokes um, from our Chemicals Regulation Division to talk to us about the biopesticide network and what work they've been up to uh, recently. So, uh, Lisa, over to you. Thank you. Lisa, you're very quiet. You, I don't know if you want yep, to come. My, yep. my mic had moved. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah, HSC is the appointed authority for the regulation of chemicals. Uh, this includes pesticides, uh, which are also referred to as plant protection products. And today I'm going to be speaking specifically about biopesticides. So, the um, EU legislation on the 1st of, 1st of January 21 was uh, retained into GB law and the official title remains Regulation EC 1107-2009 for regulating plant protection products. There are also other, several other regulations which are also um, retained into GB law. Within these regulations, there are ones such as for data requirements, which are specific for areas such as chemistry, mammalian toxicology, ecotoxicology, environmental behaviour, operator, bystander and worker exposure. So, and efficacy. So there are a lot of areas that we deal with and there's specific data requirements. In recent years, there's been a decrease in the number of conventional chemicals available and there's been a development of biopesticides due for their potential for low risk, so those are on the increase. Biopesticides can be very useful tool within integrated pest management, which we know is of particular interest to DEFRA, the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and the role within sustainable farming. So in recent years, HSC has been considering how we best legislate for the, uh, best evaluate these within the le legislative setting. Next slide, please. Thank you. So first of all, what are biopesticides? The term isn't very well defined globally, but for us, we have a biopesticide scheme and that includes microorganisms such as bacteria and fungi, semiochemicals and botanicals. Now, when you're regulating um, a conventional chemical, you, um, an applicant will submit a large dossier of information with studies and uh, data that matches each individual data requirement. And these are evaluated by the various specialists. As you can imagine, this is a very huge dossier of information. The 
biopesticides have a somewhat less information because of their nature. Um, microbiology and microorganisms have their own data requirements because of their nature due to being able to proliferate potentially within the environment. So this has to be considered slightly differently. So I was considering how best to uh, relate the difference between a conventional chemical and biopesticide and came up with this scenario, so a metaphor of making a bread. So for the first recipe, there's no need to read all the detail, but that you can tell is very detailed, it's got all the information you need, times, rates and things. And at the end of it, you will hopefully end up with a perfect loaf, whether you're an experienced baker or not. Whereas the second recipe, which is the equivalent to a biopesticide dossier, it has all the underpinning information and uh, a lot of sort of uh, information that would help. But unless you're an experienced baker, you might not end up with a decent bread, uh, loaf of bread that you could eat. So this is how I'm trying to do explain what happens with a biopesticide um, dossier when it's submitted. We try to ensure that they are uh, evaluated by our bio contact network and these are specialists within each branch of our specialist areas who are familiar with the way these ap uh, applications are evaluated within HSE. They are familiar with the guidance documents which is associated with semiochemicals and botanicals because for those two types of biopesticides we uh, use the conventional chemical data requirements but uh, can assess them slightly differently according to the guidance documents. For microbials, they have their own data requirements, as mentioned, um, but still we require, um, they have their own guidance documents as well. So the experience of uh, regulatory scientists within our branches is crucial. This is why um, we've made sure the network keeps together and they will liaise during the evaluation. And often some, uh, and especially such as the efficacy specialists will be crucial when we're looking at the mode of action. Next slide, please. So as well as evaluating biopesticides and liaising with each other, our biocontact specialists have also been active in the European and international uh, evaluation of guidance um, for EPO and OECD. And when we were in the EU, we were also very uh, much involved in the biopesticide working group there. Um, now we have also this year been making sure that we liaise with um, other divisions of HSC and particularly the specialist microbiologists and also with. You may have gone on to mute um, accidentally because certainly I can't hear you. Oh, yep, yeah. I don't know how that happened. I've been a few, having a few IT issues today. So um, where did I go from mute from? Sorry. If you go uh, just a couple of seconds before you went off, uh, that's fine. Yeah, that's OK. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I was, we've been liaising sort of both European and internationally and also making sure we've been in contact with our using our expertise within HSE, not within the chemical regulations department division, but going to other microbiologists within HSE, which has been um, a very useful and um, very positive experience and working with other government departments. So next slide, please. So as you can see, the number of biopesticide active substances which are approved and available in UK products has increased over time. We did a pilot, pilot scheme in 2003 and then introduced the proper biopesticide in uh, 2006. And so the, as you can see, throughout this time, the number of products has been increasing. This is the number of active substances. The number of products have been increasing as well. Um, and this in involves both the microorganisms, semiochemicals and botanicals, which have all sorts. We've got bacteria um, approved and viruses. There's, there's all sorts. So it's worth having a look at those. Next slide, please. So the biopesticide industry is very dynam dynamic and innovative. And as we move forward, CRD Biocontacts will continue to forge links with experts in other regulatory regimes. We feel it's um, important to reach out to all other re regu regulatory regimes, academia and industry stakeholders. And by using suitable collaboration, we aim to keep pace with future changes and appropriately tackle risks. So businesses can trade and use products in a way that does not put people or the environment at risk. And that's the end of my 
presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, and just illustrates uh, how we're having to uh, make best use of those networks moving forward. OK, our final presentation before we move to some some questions is from Daniel Barrowcliffe, and this is really looking at how we maintain the UK as one of the safest places to work. Um, and uh, Daniel's going to tell us about the asbestos work that he's been doing. Uh, so, Daniel, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm going to present to you today on some work HSC did to understand the asbestos exposures of people working in the licensed asbestos industry. Uh, some work that I helped carry out when I worked in the fibres and minerals team at Buxton. Um, and just to first give you a bit of an overview of why we did the research and, and what it involved. I think the headline figure when we talk about asbestos is that we still see 5,000, around 5,000 cancer deaths a year attributed to historical asbestos exposure. And so as part of ongoing current risk management to reduce current exposures, um, we still remove asbestos containing materials from buildings. Um, and that's normally at the end of a building's life cycle during refurbishment. But the higher end risk end of this removal work is carried out by contractors who require a license from HSC to operate. And given the materials that these workers work with, um, they potentially face the highest risk of exposure of any um, worker cohort in Great Britain. Um, and therefore, it, HSC felt it was important to gather information on what those current exposures are and what working practices are within that industry, uh, whether they're complying with HC guidance. Um, the work in part acted as an update to work done in 1999, which looked at similar things. Uh, but since then, regulation and guidance has changed quite significantly, so it's important to see whether those changes in guidance and regulation have had an effect in reducing exposure. So in order to do this, HC scientists visited eight sites between 2016 and 2019, uh, and monitored the asbestos removal process from beginning to end and took air samples throughout the process um, to measure the fibre concentrations in the air. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and also, while we were on site, we took um, recordings of CCTV of work inside the removal enclosure. These are enclosures built around the area as workers carry out the removal in order to contain uh, any asbestos fibres released. And this allowed us to have some proper observations of the working practices. And I think from the observation, from our observations while we were on site, um, we saw, I'm sorry, in the previous slide there, we saw an image of um, someone removing an, an AIB panel from, uh, and uh, Westing Downs, they do it. And with the majority of the time, we saw good working practice such as this. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, um, we can see we did see in a minority of cases we did observe people not following guidance and this was normally either uh, not properly wetting materials or breaking materials as they removed them and this still here shows someone breaking an AIB panel as they pull it down. I mean to stress this was a minority of cases uh, but we did see it. Um, and the other thing I think to stress the key finding from this work was that from the air samples we took inside the enclosure while they were working to measure the fiber concentrations we saw a significant reduction from when we carried out similar work in 1999 that I mentioned before. So the changes in guidance and regulation have had an effect in reducing those fiber concentrations and therefore reducing the exposures. Um, however, as being said, from some of the observed working practice, we might see room for improvement, uh, as we always look to see uh, and look to constantly progress um, in terms of reducing exposures. Uh, next slide. And I think the other key finding in terms of reducing those exposures was that during activities to construct and then dismantle these exposures, uh, these enclosures during work, we didn't see consistent use of respiratory protective equipment. But what we did see from our sampling is we did occasionally see asbestos fibres in the air. So this activity does act as a route of exposure and therefore going forward, we would want to see that more consistent use of respiratory protective equipment from workers in order to uh, reduce their exposure even more. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so, so just, just to summarise, those are the those are the key findings from the work. Um, a reduction in fibre concentrations levels since 1999, quite a significant one, um, but some potential for improvement in terms of more consistent use of respiratory protective equipment during activity to set up and dismantle enclosures. Um, 
And just to say, um, you can find it linked in the uh, in the annual science review. There is a more detailed report that goes into some of the more detailed findings um, if, if you have more interest in the topic. Um, but that's all I'm going to say for now. Thank you.